This week on FAS TV, we are on the Isle of Tyree to hear about how cattle grazing is aiding biodiversity. And we get a roundup from the first successful FAS Connect conference, which brought together farmers from across Scotland. The Isle of Tyree is abundant with wildlife and biodiversity. Working together, RSPB and the crofters of the island use cattle throughout the winter months to graze the reef. No grazing throughout the summer months allows the wildlife and biodiversity to thrive. I'm John Bowler uh, and I'm the RSPB officer here on the Isle of Tyree and I've been here 22 years. <clears throat> We're standing right on the edge of uh, the, the reef reserve which is uh, a really fantastic bit of maca habitat on Tyree. I, I'm biased but I would say it's the best maca on the island for, from a biodiversity point of view certainly and possibly from a grazing's point of view as well. Uh, so it's 380 hectares of dunes uh, that we're standing on here going right out dry maca big areas and then right down into the northeast corner goes down into wet maca and uh, fen and actually with pools which we call mesotrophic pools they're kind of naturally rich pools so it's a really special bit of habitat uh, really quite diverse in, in terms of the habitats we have and it supports an enormous amount of biodiversity basically that the land is managed by the reef graziers and their cows uh, and we uh, kind of assist in that process so we have a management plan but essentially the grazing is done by those cows to a fixed format that hasn't changed really since uh, before the Second World War. Uh, so essentially there are 206 cattle go out uh, plus followers and those cattle belong to the crofts at Crozopole, Kenneve and Balafetrish adjoining the reef and those the number of cattle that go out uh, per croft assuming is exactly the same as it was uh, you know, 100 years ago. Um, so those cattle go out, uh, they go out on the 1st of November. So right now we've got no cattle at all. We've got a very long summer grazing break, which uh, from a macro point of view is really good. It means all the flowers get a chance to, to flower, to set seed and do what they need to do. And that in turn attracts loads of bumblebees, maybe not on a day like this when it's a bit damp and dry, but a really healthy selection of vertebrates, particularly bumblebees, of which the great yellow is, is the really important one, the great yellow bumblebee. Um, so cattle are here all winter, uh, outwintered, really important outwintering for them. And then come May time, uh, we have a lot of breeding waders out here too. So we have about 330 pairs of lapwing, for example, on the reef, which is a, a staggering number. And we actually have slightly lower stocking densities in April and May, and that's something we, we sort out with the graziers. Quite often they want to take their stock away at that time of year, but we uh, rebate the rent for those two months so that they can uh, do that and have their cattle somewhere else. And that means there's less stock around for potential trampling of nests, that kind of thing. Um, but that works really well, and then all the cattle are off by the end of May, and we have this long, really long grazing break, as I say. So in, in terms of livestock, it's, it's cattle only. We don't have any sheep here, and that's not something that we've specified. It's something that was already traditionally happening here. It was a, a site for outwinter cattle. I think a long, long time ago, there would have been sheep out here at times, uh, but at the moment, it, it, it's cattle, and that suits us very well. Sheep do tend to select it, graze a bit more, so they will graze out some of the, the orchids that we have a big spread of here uh, in the spring when the cattle are still out they would actually graze some of those so uh, for us cattle grazing is the best uh, and that also just happens to suit the graziers here too. So we work very closely with the reef graziers who, who uh, manage this land with their cattle and yes so we over many years we've, we've established a good a really good working relationship with them and that's it's based on getting to know them and what they they need from the reef and also getting to know us and what what we're kind of thinking about here but essentially we're all on the same page we want this area to be grazed by cattle outwintered uh, and that's the most important thing for this habitat and then having a grazing break in the summer means all the flowers can come through uh, for the the bumblebees and all the rest of it here yeah I think the situation here on the reef with the reef graziers is it's not unique but it, it's, it's very unusual in, in the RSPB context so in other places uh, for example on Isla we actually run our own farms we have our own cattle um, and, and have done it that way but for me this works better 
this is a, has a really nice working relationship with the community. So you're working with them, you get to understand them and what they want from the, from the reef as well. Um, and they also get to understand why we, we're trying to do what we're doing here as well. And that, that cuts both ways. I think that's really good. There are examples on uh, Uist where we do the similar kind of working relationship at Balranald with the crofting communities there. There's another site they're just setting up on South Uist too. So it's something that we're um, looking at as a model that could be rolled out elsewhere and it all starts with a conversation. That, that's what it's really about, getting to know what the RSPB might want out of a, a location and also making sure that the graziers there get what they want as well. And if the two match up, which in many cases of course they do, then that's a good starting point. So RSPB's been involved on the reef uh, for at least, uh, let me see, maybe 26, 27 years, something like that. So I've been here 22. Uh, I'm trying to think, my predecessors were two, three, four. Yeah, it would be about 27, 28 years. So it's quite, quite a long period of time. Um, the ground itself is actually owned by Highlands and Islands Airports. Uh, and we have a long-term lease on it. I think it's a 22-year lease. Um, so that gives us some kind of security over uh, the tenure. And of course, every year we always give the grazing let to the reef grazers, of course. I mean, morally, it's their ground, essentially. So that, that's never going to change. Essentially, we manage this uh, area of land. The, the first reason is for its breeding waders. So we have internationally important numbers of breeding waders here. I was talking to a colleague from Wales. That I think there's as many breeding lapwing on this reserve as there are in Wales, it's, or maybe slightly less, but you know, in context, that's huge. So we have about 330 pairs of lapwing, 120 pairs of oyster catcher, 50 pairs of red shank, 40 pairs of ring plover, 50 pairs of dunlin, uh, and about 120 drumming snipe. So a really impressive list of breeding waders. Uh, but actually, the management here also uh, allows us to have breeding corn crakes because there's a big grazing break in the summer. So we have maybe uh, 20 corn crakes, 20 calling male corn crakes here as well. Uh, so really, you know, a, a, an important chunk of the corn crakes on the island are here uh, on the reserve and also on the airport, which is in the middle of the reserve. Let's not forget we have an active airfield out there too. Um, but we also have uh, a nice range of uh, wildflowers. We have Irish ladies' tresses, lesser butterfly orchids, some rare plants. And using these flowers, a really diverse uh, fauna of uh, invertebrates, particularly bumblebees, including the great yellow bumblebee, which is the really rare one. Corn crakes are one of the many species found on Tyree. Reef grazing is important in ensuring that these birds have a safe environment during the breeding season. Yeah, so agri-environment schemes are really very important on this island. So we have a lot of really uh, good habitats, but agri-environment schemes ensure that they're managed in a really good way. So, for example, here on the reef, this, this is all in um, a scheme which has uh, allows a complete grazing break in the summer, uh, which is really important for all these maca flowers. They come through and then the great yellow bumblebees and other bumblebees that come here use these flowers. Um, so those schemes are really important. Uh, if this area was grazed by sheep all year round, we would lose those flowers. They wouldn't be here. So getting people uh, to do the right thing, but being paid to do so, and they get compensated for that, that that's really good for both um, uh, the wildlife, the bees, and also people. Well, they're getting the money for that. So that's one scheme, but there are other schemes. Uh, there's a scheme for uh, breeding waders. So we have very large numbers of breeding waders on the island. We're very blessed with that. Uh, and those schemes will involve reducing stocking densities or removing stock during the critical breeding season um, when uh, birds are nesting and there's a risk that the eggs get trampled uh, if you have really heavy stocking densities. But of course, the key thing is those areas are grazed. So people must have stock. That, that's the most important thing. Those areas get grazed down so that when the birds are nesting, uh, the chicks have access to the soil. That's where the food is, so they need to have that as well. And then the third one I guess we have here is the corn crake scheme. Uh, and that's been running a long time in various forms uh, and it's worked really well. So the numbers of corn crakes that we had back in the 80s, they were down to sort of 90, 100 calling males, uh, went right, right up. As soon as you started having schemes, people cutting later and cutting friendly, so that's from the inside of the field out, pushing the young to the edges of the field, then uh, numbers increase massively. Uh, we currently have about, well, 293 calling males this year. That, that was the, the final survey total, which is 20 up on last year. So that, that's really good. That's good news that they've gone up. And there's no doubt that that's due to the agri-environment schemes in place, people doing uh, friendly cutting, 
uh, late cutting and having early cover as well, places for these corn crates to come into when they first arrive. So these schemes are really important on the island for biodiversity and hopefully also for farmers and crofters too. It's, a, it's another form of income to keep them doing what they're doing. Okay, so part, part of the agri-environment schemes, the ones we're talking about, corn crates, is actually um, a collaborative project that's going on and that's a scheme that involves uh, nine working businesses at the moment and we've got another five hopefully we'll get into it this year they're going in as well and that's looking at uh, concrete conservation on a landscape scale so um, it, it, it's all very well and good one person doing the right thing here but others not doing the right thing uh, if you have it on a, on a much bigger scale then it becomes it actually increases the value of what they're doing so you have we're looking at early cover, so that's the areas that the concretes come into first. Um, late cover, that's once the areas have been cut or grazed, where do those concretes go? They still need to be in, in, in grass or vegetation to feed and finish up what they need to do. Uh, and if you do that on a big scale with uh, collaborative people, then one area might act as late cover for your neighbours concretes they may come here or you might have early cover that your neighbors fields will use later on in the silage in the silage fields that's where the concretes will go to so having it on that bigger scale actually increases your population of concretes in, in, a, in a really good way and I, and I think we've seen that with, with this increase in the population this year. We know quite a lot about concretes uh, and there was a, a man called uh, Rhys Green who's just the guru of concretes he's done a lot of research mostly on the neighboring island of Col, a little bit here um, and he's found out a great deal about corn crates. But one of the things he discovered was that when the young come back, they come back essentially within 10 kilometers of where they were born. So a coal corn crake might come to Tyree and a Tyree corn crake might get a coal, but a Tyree corn crake born here wouldn't go to Uist or Barra or, or, or somewhere else. They very much come back to where they're born, uh, which has a plus and a minus. It means you can manage your population. If you do the right things, you build your population up here. But if the things go wrong, they can lo be lost very quickly. And that's what's happened across much of the UK. And that's why holding on to these populations in places like Tyree is so important. Seeing as we're on the reef, I can tell you a bit more about this agri-environment scheme. Um, this is one that, uh, it's an interesting one in that RSPB manage this site, we have a long-term lease on it, but the actual management is done by the reef graziers. It's their cattle that do all the, the hard work here. And uh, what we do is we apply for the, uh, the money and then we actually share it with the graziers. And that, that's, that's a way that they get paid for what they're doing. Uh, we get a bit of money for monitoring and all the other things we do, the fence maintenance and stuff, but it, it's a collaborative work and that, that, that's the way it should be, that the money goes to everyone. Um, and that was actually how RSPB got involved in the site in the early days, before my time here, was uh, the graziers themselves couldn't apply for agri-environment scheme money, but if they have one person, the RSPB, in charge, we can get that money and then share it with them. And also we uh, share some of the rent as well, so we pay for some of the rent from Heil. So it's just, it, it helps everything. We get what we want, the graziers get what they want, uh, and we have all this wonderful biodiversity. The reef grazing on Tyree is utilised by many crofters to outwinter cattle, which reduces their costs of purchased feed and bedding. Uh, I'm Archie John McLean. Um, we have the tendency of hillipulfarum. Before we got hillipulfarum, we had uh, crofts up in the Kennevee and Balafetarish areas, and so that's what really gets us involved in the reef. We the croft shares, but we do work at all as a as an overall uh, business. So we work a total of uh, round about 130 suckler cows, mainly spring calving. Uh, we, we also have sheep as well. So uh, we sell the calves. Uh, the better of the calves, as many as, uh, you know, are over maybe 320 kilos, roughly about that, in October, and the rest of them get kept until the early springtime. Well, the reef grazing is very important to our business. Uh, they, um, as it is to all the shareholders that are on the croft, they're all, they're, they're, it's all crofts that have got shares on the reef. Um, and these crofts would not be able to keep cattle uh, without having their, their, their wintering on the, on the reef. The way the reef is managed uh, with the deferred grazing, uh, with the animals going out on the 1st of November till the end of May, it's as good as having another a silage pit full of, 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 of silage. Uh, I mean, the cows utilise this um, this grass uh, very well, especially if the calves are spent off them. 
in the autumn before they go out there. Some people do put their calves out with them, but the ones that go out without calves, these cows actually gain condition for a month or so, which helps them to then get through the rest of the winter. Very often cattle don't need fed until well into February. So yeah, I mean the reef is very, very, very important to all the crofters in, 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 in the area. The, um, there are about 30 crofts, or plus than 30 crofts benefit from shares on the reef, uh, with 199 cows grazing the, the area. So, you know, that's really, really important. There's 206 in total uh, of cows come out. Um, mind you, that can also lead to more animals than that, because you have two uh, yearlings to a cow share, so some people may um, put out some younger animals than cows, and in that case, you know, the total count could end up being more. There are many benefits that the reef grazing gives the crofters on tidy. It's just so important that, you know, it, 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 we just couldn't keep the cows in number for that. And in turn, we wouldn't have these cows then in the summer time to graze other land um, and oh, you know obviously the costs uh, are, are a lot less when, when cattle are, are, are able to uh, you know graze longer into the year without uh, high cost inputs um, yes I mean we do have to give them a concentrated feed away into the springtime for you know for nutritional reasons when you know when they've newly calved and after calving and to get them back in season for the bull again but uh, yeah I mean the the cows that are on this this grazings uh, you know are really uh, cheaper to keep than ones that would be in a shed or or, or, or being fed all winter uh, with with silage or, or, or concentrates so it's Yes, I mean it does help us to keep cows. Yeah, no, it doesn't cause any 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 bother at all. It's it's. I mean everybody. I mean it, this has gone on for so long. I mean you know I'll I'll be at least the third generation that has used the reef in this manner. So it's nothing new for us. But it's so important, although to you know to be involved in the conservation side of it uh, as things are nowadays, and to also get conservation payments because you know these are the monies that help us you know, to keep cows. I mean, it, it is more expensive to operate nowadays than what it was, obviously, two or three generations ago. So, you know, any monies that we can get in for these reasons, um, you know, help the overall business and the sustainability of keeping cows. But, you know, there is no problem with, uh, you know, with a shared grazing. In the winter time, if you, if you drive around and, and you look up across the reef, you'll see animals in batches, and they are usually each individual herd's animals. Uh, they seem to graze fairly separately. They will cross paths, but if you go to collect your own cows, they usually walk away from the other ones. And yeah, it's, 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 there's no problem and everybody gets on well. At the end of January, the first FAS Connect conference was held at Murrayfield, which brought together farmers from groups across Scotland to hear from a variety of speakers. My name is Jennifer Struthers, I work as a consultant for SEC Consulting and I deliver a lot of the farm advisory service work. So FAS Connect came about because there was a bit of a gap between the delivery of one to many, so one to big groups and one to one, so the sort of ILG side of things. So what FAS Connect fills is the gap of one to few, so looking at small discussion groups of about 10 to 15 people and really focusing on peer-to-peer -peer learning and knowledge exchange between those groups. It's also very much farmer-led, so it's what those groups want to talk about. We've got a wide variety of groups talking about a wide variety of subjects, but the beauty of it is it's what the farmers want to want to learn about. So the conference here today at Murrayfield was the first of its kind for FAS Connect. Um, we look, aim to have three panel sessions covering a variety of topics. The aim was to look at sort of the future, so we call it tackling the future. We started with a brief of what's it going to be like to be farming in 2045. So it was, it was really a wide horizon scanning piece rather than the nitty gritty of the day to day. So we had set out with three panel sessions, one on global outlook, 
one in climate and sustainability and one in time and technology and again it was very much looking at what farmers could do to ensure that they have a sustainable business for the future. To be honest the biggest attraction about coming today was probably the line up of speakers, the diversity from amongst all speakers here today was fantastic so couldn't really miss the opportunity to come and you know get a, an insight to what everyone's opinions were. Yeah. Within my job and also the business at home can be quite busy with lots on Usually weekends is my time to crack on with work at home, but coming here today, it's really put into perspective being able to manage that time far better, and that's something that I need to look at with my job and also the business at home and figure out a real solution on how to get the best balance between work and, you know, playtime, basically. The groups are fantastic. You're getting a bunch of like-minded individuals in the one space, and it's so great just to bounce off of each other with different ideas, what people are up to and how can I implement them into my own business at home. So the Fast Connect groups are fantastic for just doing so much networking within a small group in a, such a small space of time. Women Gem is very interesting, um, chatting about work-life balance as well and profitability. You know, a lot of busy farmers, you know, that never actually take a step back, the likes of today, it's great to take a step back and say, are we actually farming smart here or are we just busy and we think we're making money because we're busy? You know, time management as well. I know I was sitting there going through my daily routine thinking there's money, there's time to be saved here. You know, in our daily routine just by a couple of changes. So The carbon topics have been really interesting to understand, you know, how the measurements and stuff, because for us it's quite an important thing coming forward. Funding is going to be a massive thing, potentially affect the business in a big way, because beef and sheep is generally not very productive without without farming support. Um, but it's been really interesting hearing from other other um, speakers talking about their changes they've carried out within their business as well as, um, you know, like work-life balance is quite important. Networking is really important and that's when you learn things, but also questions the stuff you're doing at home to, to whether we should be changing some systems or changing something within the business to try and improve things. It's been a really interesting conference. It's been good to hear the perspective of loads of different people from various different um, parts of the industry. For me, it's been really great to hear about some farmers and what they're doing to improve their own well-being. So there's been a lot of chat today about mindsets and having that healthy mindset to make these changes. And a lot of the, the things that farmers have done that we've heard about today, it's, it all comes back to that healthy mindset and opening their mind to, to new changes. Um, also, there's been a bit of chat about time and the importance of that and, and making time to do the things that you want in life. And that's very much the ethos of Farmstrong Scotland. If there was one thing that I'd really want people to take away from today, and farmers especially are ter terrible for this, um, is don't worry about what anyone else thinks. Just do what is the right thing for you and your business and your goals and your bank balance um, and your time off instead of having to try and keep up with it, the neighbours all the time. Hello, I'm Tiffany Stevenson bringing you this week's Rural Roundup. It's lovely to have a beautiful sunny day, the snowdrops behind me are out in force now and occasionally you feel like spring might be just around the corner. People definitely being able to get on with the ploughing now but the wet weather is definitely delaying progress at the minute so fingers crossed uh, the land starts drying up soon. We've also had some great news about the Agri-Environment Climate Scheme. So the great news is that £7 million has been awarded to 517 farms uh, for the 2023 scheme, which is excellent news, it's great to hear. Overall, £27 million will be uh, paid out in the lifetime of the contracts, so this will help applicants uh, support land management activities which will benefit nature and mitigate against climate change. It's great to hear um, that these contracts have been awarded. So for 2024, there's a new round of applications which are now open. So there is more than four million pounds which has been made available for slurry storage and irrigation lagoons um, to improve water quality in the rural area. So these are great opportunities that if you're needing them to take advantage of. They have announced that this will be the final year that support will be available for slurry storage. So if you have been thinking about it, it's definitely the year to actually go ahead and do something about it. So for the slurry storage and for standalone irrigation lagoons, applications for these are now open and close on the 19th of April. This isn't that far away, so if it is something uh, you're interested in, make sure you start having a look at the application process sooner rather than later. 
If you're looking to apply for an irrigation lagoon and an agro-environment management scheme option, you'll have until the 10th of June for this deadline because um, you can put both applications in at the same time. So if you are looking to uh, put up more slurry storage, it is nationally available with the exception of people who are in designated nitrate vulnerable zones. Um, but all other people who are out with the NBZ areas are eligible for applications. So businesses that currently house livestock on slurry based systems with less than six months storage capacity will be eligible for this options. So thinking about payment rates, there has uh, been a slight change to the payment rates from previous years. The standard cost for cubic metres of capacity created increases to £20 per metre cubed. Funding remains restricted to a maximum 2,000 cubic metres of storage as well. So if you're thinking about Irrigation Lagoon, which will really help your water use efficiency, this item can be standalone or be part of a wider agri-environment application, as I've already said. So for the standalone irrigation, applications will be assessed on their own merit and against other standalone Irrigation Lagoon applications if budget pressures constrain the ability of them to approve applications. So the deadline for this is 19th of April. Successful applications will receive contracts from May 2024 onwards so it is quite a quick turnaround period for this. There has been an increase in the amount that can be claimed um, on, for an irrigation lagoon so payment rates have been changed and the maximum payments has now been increased to £40,000 per business. So today I have spoken about the slurry storage options and irrigation lagoons which are available under the Agri-Environment Climate Scheme. There are other options available, um, so there's the organic maintenance and organic conversion which is available. There's also Agri-Environment uh, Climate Scheme, so this will be for nature options um, which are also available. So make sure you have a look and see if there's any of these you'd be interested in. As we're heading to the end of February, just now is a great time to have a think. Have you put up a new fence line? Have you changed the field's shape? Have you put up a new shed in a field? Have a think about these things and it's a great opportunity to do any land maintenance forms um, just now, well in advance of the single application form. This will give an opportunity to make sure maps are as up to date as possible so it will make your single application form quicker and easier to fill in because you've already made these changes. So it's a good opportunity to look at these just now. At the moment we've been having plenty of farmers asking questions about adding fertiliser after such a wet winter. At the moment the crops are looking pretty good. Um, they're not looking like they're looking for nitrogen at the moment, but as we know, this can always change pretty quickly. Having had such a wet winter, um, there's a good chance that a lot of the residual nitrogen has been wash washed out of the soils. So make sure um, you have a think about what you're applying and when you're applying it. A great option is um, to listen to the Cropcast podcast, which is a farm advisory service podcast. There, February episode is talking all about applying fertiliser in the spring. This is an excellent podcast and will be an opportunity to hear what the thoughts are on what you should be applying and when. Thank you for listening and we'll see you again next time.